Is it Dupo Remo? Yes. Dupo Remo. Is it okay if we talk a tiny bit more about it? Is, sure. Do you not I like suppose. to talk about your own work? No, I'd love to talk about my own work. I just don't do any work, so it's hard okay. to do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I love to talk about my own work too. And I, I've been reading this book about Alfred Hitchcock. And once he got to like retirement age or whatever, people would ask him if they could interview him and he'd never turn anybody down. It'd be like for a college newspaper or whatever, a bunch of kids in high school want to talk to Alfred Hitchcock and he'd be like, by all means, he'd sit down because he just loved to talk about his, his body of work and his attitude about film and all sorts of stuff to have the spotlight on himself, I guess. And and I totally understand that. I, oh, it's just f so fun when, well, it doesn't happen anymore. But it used to, people would ask us, like, hey, can we interview you about the Dune Steve? <laughs> can we interview you, you about that attempt you made on the vice president's life? Oh, wait, that doesn't happen anymore either. Yeah, in your story, she becomes beautiful in everybody's eyes and it changes her. It changes the way she thinks about herself and thinks about other people. And it doesn't change her in a positive way. Right. So was that just a natural thing that happened? Did you seek out to make a statement or like that? Or did you just say what would happen if, and that naturally happened? Yeah, it was, it seemed kind of like the natural thing that someone would do. It's like someone gets a lot of money and then they forget where they came from or something like that. You know, now they're, they're they can hang out with the rich people. It's like, can't buy me love. You know, the guy's suddenly popular and he throws the crap bomb on his old best friend's house. Wow, I haven't thought about that in years and years. That was Patrick Dempsey, huh? Right. Well, who was the girl? Did she ever go on to do anything? I always thought that it was Robin Wright Penn was the girl, but it wasn't. So I don't know. They were very similar looking, though. They're both blondes, freckly a little bit. And the movies came out almost at the same time. Princess mm. Bride and uh, Can't Buy Me Love. It's funny. There was a guy that kind of looked like Patrick Dempsey that we knew growing up, and we always just called him "Can't Buy Me Love." Oh, that's great. <laughs> that was our nickname for him. Did women find him attractive because he looked like somebody like that? I don't know. I didn't keep tabs on what women found attractive in those days. Ooh. I just knew they found too me busy. attractive. Uh, too busy <laughs> reading Lord of the Rings. <laughs> but yeah, it, it just seems kind of like you know, you you give somebody a great gift, and the tendency would be for them to change in a non-positive way and they need to learn that that's not okay you know you need to be the same person no matter what your situation is you need to be a good person no matter what your situation is i should say if you're already crappy then you should change better if you were a good person before you need to stay a good person no matter what things happen success shouldn't turn you into a piece of crap money shouldn't turn you into a piece of crap looks shouldn't turn you into a piece of crap and yeah this person has to learn the hard way spoiler alert she loses her gift oh do you feel like that that was an inevitable way for the story to end yeah i did i felt like it had to be a temporary thing i don't know why that is does it make you uncomfortable that i'm asking you about the story no because Suddenly the room has gotten very, very quiet. It's because all the other people that were in here before went to bed. Rage quit the show. Yeah. <laughs> and then we've talked about our own writing styles a lot. And something that I've reiterated a lot on the show is that you tend to go and, or at least in the stories that you've shared with me in the last few years, you go in a darker direction maybe a more cynical direction, maybe a more nihilistic direction than I do, where I find it really hard to punish the main character, to see evil triumph or to, you know, see somebody suffer and not want to relieve that suffering by the end of the story. And a lot of times you just say, no, that's the point of the story. She had her chance to be beautiful and she blew it. The end. Well, it wasn't so much that that's the end. I mean, the, the the point of the story isn't for her to become beautiful, but more for her to learn the lesson. Well, okay, maybe that was a bad example because, yeah, your story still ends on a hopeful note. But I, could you have ended that story with there's a serial killer and he only kills the most beautiful women in the world and he sees her walking down the street and he's like, oh, oh, oh my best one yet. Fade to black. <laughs> I wouldn't have ended it that way. It's funny because you talk about that and we've, we've mentioned it several times. And I think the ideas that I come up with are something. As I've gotten older, they've softened. 
I don't go that route as much as I used to. I think the stories that I used to write and I shared with you from back in the day are the ones that you remember more. And maybe because of that shock value that they had to them or something. But yeah, I, I have a tendency not to do the hard thing like that anymore. And, you know, yeah, you got to put your character through the misery. I mean, that's the whole point of the story. There's just things that they have to go through that will get them to learn the lesson that they're supposed to learn from the story. Often that kind of thing happens where they get the gift and then they have to have it taken away from them to, for them to finally realize what they were supposed to learn. I don't know. The more we talk about it, it makes me think, boy, that's uh, trite and overdone and just like every other story out there. Well, it's archetypical. Mm, yeah, maybe that's well, it. I, I would imagine that there are Greek myths where that happens, you know, where somebody gets the power of a god or somebody gets to transcend normal humanity and that has to be taken away for them to learn what it means to be a person, what it means to be good, what it means to have responsibility. And even then, it might have been an old story. There's nothing new under the sun. And you can beat yourself up saying, you know, oh, shoot, this is exactly like, or I certainly have many, many times saying, oh, shoot, it's like this or like that. It's like Can't Buy Me Love. <laughs> yeah. But it's just the way that you tell the story. And you know what? Maybe it's okay that Stephanie Meyer has this vampire love triangle thing, the same as Joss Whedon did on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Maybe it's okay. I don't know that you can tell stories that are that similar and one is not necessarily a ripoff of the other. It's just a point that wanted to be made or a story that wanted to be told in a different way. It, it could be that when that came out, when the Buffy show came out, that people said, you know what, that's just like something else from the 70s. Or that's like, oh, you know, I read this kind of thing. He's ripping off this. And he, and, and he wasn't. I don't know. That's something that is difficult for me to get past with my own writing is when it's really similar to something else. And it, right. it could be similar to other stories I've written. And, and, and I do that a lot. I'll, I'll write stories that, that have very similar themes or very similar endings or similar protagonists or antagonists and, and all that. And when I'm ripping off myself, I don't care because I think I can tell the same plot in many different ways with different characters and all that. And there's nothing wrong with it. But when it, somebody points out, well, that's Harriet Potter, <laughs> you know, or, you know, that's just like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or fill in the blanks. Then I either feel really defensive or I get all depressed about it. Yeah, that is tough too. Like it, it, worst of all is when it's, not even something that you've seen or known beforehand. I remember way back in the day when the show first started, Doug McIntyre sent us the first story that we ran on there. And then a little while after that story ran, he said, oh, I just wrote this other story. And I showed it to somebody and they said, oh, that's just like Lars and the Real Girl. And he had no idea what he was even talking about. And so he found this Lars and the Real Girl movie and he watched it and he went, oh, crap. It is just like Lars and the Real Girl. And he wouldn't send us the story. He was just like, I guess I need to just put that one away and call it practice because it's way too much like this other thing that he'd never heard of before. That's got to be uh, the most frustrating. You know, the, I've seen that with various things where people say, oh, you're just ripping off this. And they'll be like, I'd never heard of this. Several authors will sue somebody over, oh, you ripped off my story. Mm. And well, they didn't rip off their story. They never even read your story. Your story was in some obscure sci-fi magazine from 30 years ago. Nobody ripped that off. It just happens that, that they're similar and there are lots of ideas that are similar. But these days, apparently, you can uh, win money that way. And so people do it. Bit of a bummer. But I read a book about The Twilight Zone last year about the making of that show. And, and that was the late 50s, early 60s. And that kind of stuff happened all the time. There'd be an episode that aired and somebody would say, that's just like a story that I have published in Amazing Fantasy or in Weird Tales or self-published on an ebook. And <laughs> yeah. I was just like, wow, really? In the 50s that happened? And I can't, I thought that, that whole litigious society of me, 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 even though I didn't, was a brand new idea. And yeah, apparently poor Rod Serling had to deal with that all the time to the point where he didn't want to do the show anymore. Because every episode would bring up more of those. And the CBS legal department would say, well, did you know that so-and-so wrote a story? Line? Which is got to suck, man. Yeah. It's hard enough to make good art. 
without all the many, many concessions you have to make. And then also the threat of, of lawsuits hanging over your head. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. I wonder what day it is. Hopefully it's March by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, if so, uh, we've talked for a heck of a long we time sure have. and we went over and I, hopefully some of this stuff was really entertaining. Hopefully something was funny. Maybe thought provoking, maybe infuriating, but you know. Hopefully, it wasn't only offensive. Hopefully, there was other things to describe it. Well, it was an experiment, and you know, maybe it was a failed experiment. But the important thing about an experiment is learning something and, and gauging your progress and saying, "Okay, this is what we found out." If this was a failed experiment, then you know it was probably still worth doing, because you know you stepped out of your comfort zone and you tried to do something and. That's always commendable is when you try to do something other than just what's comfortable, what's easy, what you always do. And uh, if one person enjoyed it, then, you know, that's, I don't know. Twice as many as last time. There you go. (laughs) And I think we'll end on that. And, uh, you know, if somebody listened to every single one of these episodes and they got here, uh, I hope you don't feel like you wasted your time. I hope you feel like you got to know us a little bit more and that we're friends and even though we don't really know each other, you're here in the room with us and you're listening to our conversation and laughing when you're supposed to and making us feel like we're not alone in the world. And, uh, you know, that's kind of why I wanted to have a podcast anyway, or at least this kind of podcast. Maybe you and I learned something about ourselves too. Just a lot of times I don't know what I feel until I hear myself say it. I was like, oh, okay, thanks, me. <laughs> and so <laughs> there we go. Thanks for uh, listening. I have been uh, Rich Outfield. Or did you want to say something? No. In 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 or, you know about goodbye and all that, or what you thought of this last month? Or I didn't. No. You think this is going to be the last episode for sure, huh? I think so. Yeah. I'm going to make sure to work it out. I think so. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah. Thanks for listening to Dupo Remo. Wait, Remo. Dopo Remo. What is that? We... I think Dupo Remo okay. sounds the best. Okay, Dupo Remo. It is. It's a good thing we finally decided on a title for this thing because... Wait, we didn't decide when we first started? That's <laughs> madness. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. Yeah, it's been fun. I hope uh, you guys enjoyed it. I've been Big Anchorage. And uh, hey, ask yourself next time you have to step out of your comfort zone. Why not? Yeah. That's the way you end it. Bam. Put a button on it and all that. That Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. This show is lame. As lame as Rich Outfield.